Hey guys, Omni here. It's time for one of our weekly Stranger Things videos to check out while we wait for Season 4, Volume 2 to come out, which will be the week after this video comes out, man. It is right around the corner, so unless, you know, things free up or anything like that, or this might be our last one until those final episodes drop. And that being said, I wanted to do one that we that involves some people we haven't actually reacted to together. This is one pretty long video. I've seen it come up, I think, once or twice in the suggestions and the comments. And I think out of the out of all the options that I still kind of had lined up, this is the one that it just calls to me the most. And I think it'll be fun to kind of go through. This is the Duffer Brothers breaking down every movie reference revealed through seasons one through three. So strap in. This one's almost 30 minutes long, man. So let's get in. And it might be longer if I have to stop and pause it for anything. So here we go. I'm Matt. And we're the Duffer Brothers and we created Stranger Things. And this is a definitive list of all the film references in Stranger Things. Well, most of them. Ish. <laughs> There's probably a bunch of unintentional ones they didn't even think about. Aliens 1 Get and 2. Get away from her, you bitch! So we're huge fans of the Alien Hell franchise. Hell yeah, man. Especially Me too. Um, Alien, Aliens. It depends on, on the year in terms of which one we think is, is better. Basically, they're both incredible films. They're Aliens both very in different. really had a big influence on season two. Especially so good. When you have the soldiers yeah. going to the underground yep. tunnel system. But I felt that. In terms of atmosphere. Not to mention Paul Reiser, man. Anyway, sorry. Like effects. Some of it we, we were inspired by in the video game Silent Hill, but some of it was also Ooh, inspired Silent by Hill. what it was like when they went on the planet in, uh, in Ridley Scott's Alien. And then we even have an, an egg there, the Dead Organ egg, which is inspired by the uh, what they discover on the planet in Alien. And that egg was real. And, no, and in season one, especially, all the spores, all the, um, <laughs> the spores blowing through the air, that was all real. We were blowing them around. Um, we had David and Winona walking around in those suits in the forest. It was old school, just blowing uh, these basically little tiny feathers um, in their faces. It was a lot of fun for them. <laughs> oh, God, please tell me it's not the kid. Police officer who discovers Will's body, we gave a little nod to Dan O'Bannon, who was the uh, writer for Alien. We should be safe because we think this is just an isolated incident. Stay true for David O'Bannon. Thank you so much. For ah, thank you. Okay. As we've said uh, before, Alien was such a huge reference for us. Altered States. Don't know this one. Altered States, I think, mostly was an inspiration in terms of just the experiments that Brenner was performing on Eleven, specifically the isolation tank is something we discussed about and, uh, and looked at that film when we, when we were building our I'd love to try tank. out an it's isolation trippy, tank trippy one day. That could have only been made in the 70s. I think it was 1980, now that I think about it. Some okay. close. Yep, yep, definitely got those vibes. Fantastic movie, man. You know, when we first came up with this idea, we were we were always talking about Stephen King and, and why his books resonated so much with us. And one of those books, of course, was was Carrie. And Carrie, of course, you have a high school girl who has these amazing powers and these amazing abilities. And we, we always looked at how King dealt with that when we, we talked about Eleven and this idea. She has these amazing abilities, but is she ultimately dangerous, especially when, we would see, when she's with these kids and we see her when she hurts Lucas out in the junkyard. And we sort of, sort of see that these powers aren't necessarily fully under her control or that she can lose control, and, and when she does, she can be dangerous. Looking at that as, as a girl with these powers who's unable to fit into society, you know, it was a real big touchstone for us. Never seen Close Encounters. The two Stevens are the biggest influence for us, so we've talked a little bit about Stephen King, and then there's Steven Spielberg, who you may have heard of. There was a lot of imagery in season two that evoked Close Encounters in the third time, particularly the sequence where Barry is kidnapped. That was the sequence when we were kids and we saw Close Encounters huh. for the first time. Interesting. That kind of stayed with us the most. So this, is this list is probably going to be a lot of... There's going to be a lot that I know, but I'm sure this is going to be a lot of... I need to finally buckle down and watch this movie one of these days. 
kind of like with the Goonies and all these other movies I've been doing here recently. So when Will is first getting signals from the Upside Down in episode one and he hears thunder outside and he opens that door, that's a pretty direct homage to Close Encounters. And we do an homage with this year with Dustin when his toys sort of all go out of control and he has to, I mean, he realizes ultimately that it's just uh, 11 manipulating it, but that was definitely a nod towards it. And then... And that, that was all, all those toys were, so we had every toy was on a, on a remote control and it was one of those things where, you know, there are about 10 toys, there's 10 remotes and you figure it's going to be an absolute disaster and it actually... <laughs> worked out Just in every, well. every hiding spot behind sofas, beds, closets, there was someone with a remote <laughs> control and they were That's all so trying cool. to get these things to all work together. It was actually, when it worked, it was it was really miraculous. And the last thing about Close Encounters, I will say, is also, you know, it's set in Indiana and that was a big uh, touchstone for us when we were deciding where to set the show. So it was things like Close Encounters and Breaking Away that uh, really inspired us uh, as kids growing up. So we felt that was a great everywhere USA uh, kind of location. <laughs> Seeing Cujo. Cujo, we obviously referenced that in season one. I think we have a, we have one of the guards in Hawkins' lab reading Cujo. It had a really nice big picture of Stephen King on the back, and we thought that was a way of tipping our hat yeah. to the king. Of Didn't course. even notice well, that, man. It's a nasty mutt. If it wasn't um, obvious, the nasty enough, mutt. Owed him God, to try to make it more. Damn, it was so easy too, shot. and I missed that. <laughs> That's right. And then in season two, we have some the, the demo dogs. There's kind of a new creature, so big, big bat dogs. So they're a little bit Cujo. They're a little bit the dogs from Ghostbusters. <laughs> but um, big bad scary dogs are always fun. Also, like the hound aliens and aliens. I don't know that I've ever seen E.T. I know like the key moments, but I can't remember anything other than the pop culture moments. If I've seen it, it is wiped from my memory. E.T. was a big film for us growing up as it was for a lot of kids. It was like mildly traumatizing, but you know, it was a huge <laughs> influence on us in terms of the opening scene of Stranger Things is, you know, our kids playing Dungeons and Dragons and eating pizza. And that's, there. you know, there's obviously a scene in E.T. where the kids are playing D&D. &D but the idea of basically- Man, I can't wait for D&D this weekend. Setting who encounters something extraordinary. The feeling that that gave us as kids is the feeling that we wanted to capture with the show. And then in episode so three in season one, we have the kids also trying to dress up Eleven to make her seem like a normal girl, which was, was a nod to when they they try to they dress up <laughs> to try to make ET. Yeah, I, I do remember that. Season two, of course, is our Halloween season, and, and ET is set around Halloween. So uh, we looked at that for inspiration in terms of the costumes that all the kids were wearing as they sort of went out and went out into the world. Never seen Escape from New York. When we pitched this to Netflix, we, we cut together a little reel that, you know, included some of the movies we loved just to get across tone, and it also it was scored to John Carpenter music. So that's sort of always been our go-to and sort of what the sound, the show can sound like. In season two, in episode seven, when Eleven ends up going to Chicago and meeting up with her sister, we use one of his scores from Escape from New York. John Carpenter is a brilliant with it and we just, musician, we say, man. This, this I is love his scores. Show, it, it just fits too perfectly. I've seen the new Firestarter. Firestarter is a, was a big reference specifically for... I've seen parts of the original. In the case that you've got a young girl that has these incredible powers. She's on the run from the government. And we also looked at Firestarter in terms of sort of the backstory for Eleven and how she can... How, how she yeah, can okay, I can see that. So We needed something visual that would represent... Eleven using her powers. You know, when she when she uses her abilities, she gets a nosebleed, and that was something we settled on very early on that we thought would very simply tell the audience each time she's used these powers. I'm Maria. Will you play with me? Frankenstein uh, was a reference in, and we included it in uh, episode two of season two when Eleven's at home alone and she's watching. And the reason we want to include that and the reason we've talked about Frankenstein writing this is that this is just that Eleven is feeling like the Frankenstein's monster. Frankenstein. And she's feeling 
isolated and alone and she she feels different from everyone else and just cut off and she feels like a monster and she's and a so product of an experiment be, uh, watching that film in uh, episode i mean episode two seen ghostbusters aim for the flat top ghostbusters <laughs> is one of our favorite films of yeah. all time I, I i i mean i we watched it way too many times as children so it's it's all over the show it's one of the one you know we gave a pretty the probably the most direct reference growing up i had only seen the, the second one you have the kids dress up and I, I watched Busters. the first one i think they're gonna wear for Halloween. all the way through for the first time it's always be a ghostbuster like eight years ago like why aren't they all just ghostbusters they can each be a ghostbusters and that and, and so that was so fun dressing up all of our kids and also deciding um, these who, characters and deciding who would be who and then we you know we just arguing about in the room and being like everyone would want to be vankman and so yeah. that sort of led to the the Venkman uh, argument. Why are you Venkman? Because I'm Venkman. No, I'm Venkman. Why can't there just be two Venkmans? Because there's only one Venkman in real life. We planned this months ago. I've seen Gremlins. You're kidding. Gremlins is, uh, Though, first of all, one it was of our so long ago, I, I barely also remember. A big reference, particularly in season it. two of the show, with Dart, which like Gizmo begins as this sort of loving creature that Dustin is trying to take care of and he, and, he, and he starts to actually care for this cute little thing. And then of course we realize that it's anything but it's, it's a baby Demogorgon. And I think there's a scene in uh, episode three, I believe, where Dart is starting to grow and he escapes and the kids are trying to attack it and, and go after it. And we, we had our composer sort of do a little theme that sounded like uh, a little bit like the original uh, Gremlin theme because we just wanted to give it a little a little tip of the hat yeah okay we're big indiana jones fans we oh me too of temple Poster. of doom and specifically we referenced it i think it was in um season two episode nine the the final episode of season two when we have max driving Billy's car and she's got a block on the uh, pedal just like short round oh, has to use okay. a block in order to drive the car in Temple of Doom when they make their escape. I remember our production designer being like, Sadie doesn't need a block, she can reach that. And then we, when we were so devastated because we wanted to give that little nod, but then we put Sadie in the car and she could not reach the pedal. Like, <laughs> and now she could, but luckily in season two she couldn't. So we got our, we got our block in there. Obviously Indiana Jones himself, you know, is a big reference for Hopper. We always, we talk to David about Harrison Ford. I can see it. More than anything else. And trying to just sort of capture that energy. That's With the look of Magnum P.I. though. People all the time. Because and I love Raiders. I think, I don't know, it's time. tough, man. David was Raiders or in season two, he Last Crusade. Anybody. And so in season three, there's a ton of um, Hopper punching people. <laughs> David is really good at capturing the, the Harrison Ford essence. Not many modern actors are able to do it, <laughs> uh, aside from Harrison Ford, of course, <laughs> who is the one and only Indiana Jones. There can be no more. That's right. The opening scene of Give season time, three man. includes something Somebody's going to do it. This, um, scientist that we were inspired by the ending of Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they open the Ark, and it just causes these horrific things to happen in that just seared itself into her brain. So we wanted to give a, a little nod a little nod to that. Like sometimes I'm more in the mood to watch um, Last Crusade. The the banter between Sean, yes. Sean Connery and Harrison Ford and it's just it's it's very similar to Raiders of course, but it's just got a little bit of a is it got a little bit of a different tone? And but if you just want to really learn how it. to make a film, I mean just watch Raiders. I mean every scene is a master class, it really is. Yes, dude. Definitely for season fucking four. Nightmare on Elm Street yeah. was a huge film for us growing up. It really scared us, but we couldn't help but keep I got the whole collection. Episode every every film. Season one when uh, Holly goes up to the wall and you can see the Demogorgon moving from behind the wall, which is very similar to when... Yeah, okay. I didn't put that together, but I definitely... Nancy's bed. I didn't in think Nightmare about that in the Which moment. Because in Nightmare on Elm Street, they, try, they did that practically, that effect yeah. of Kruger coming through the wall with latex, and that's what we attempted to do and, and failed. <laughs> we basically had our, dim, our, our monster, a guy in a suit, um, pressing him, his face and hands through the wall, and it wasn't particularly scary. We had a little, little, little toddler on set um, playing Holly, and she thought it was amusing, which was a sign that it wasn't exactly working. <laughs> so we had to uh, enhance it quite a bit with uh, CG and post-production. So it, it, we were, especially in season one, determined to do everything practically, and I think maybe it was like a 50% success rate. But it makes you more impressed about, yeah, in terms of, or more blown away by what they were able to achieve back then.
And not to mention how heavy the Nightmare on Elm Street influences are in season four. From Vecna, Robert England himself showing up, the dreamlike states of the whole situation. Chef's kiss. 100%. Hello? Well, seen all the it huge adaptations on the show. We actually first experienced it when we saw the miniseries back in uh, 1990. So we were around six or seven. Way uh, too That was the first time thing. I saw um, it too. I was six. Definitely scared of clowns, and that just pushed it over the edge. Couldn't yeah. sleep for a couple weeks. Like it, the most scared I've ever been in my life. It's an incredible book. It's really about these kids and and their friendship and how by you know working together and uniting and through their the, the strength they of their face a demon they're able to together on this incredible interdimensional evil mm -hmm. so without it i'm you know there you know there really would be no stranger things probably oh yeah i mean will's got a poster of it in his room we have everywhere they he film, moves we usually lean on jaws because i think it does to us everything that we love love about cinema it oh, has so good great characters comedy yeah spectacle it's about a chief it's, of, chief of it's easily one of my favorite movies of all time and i i think i can single-handedly blame it for my fear of water <laughs> small in, town in a small town but i will always watch it something out of the ordinary happens so it's a big influence in big that influence. way I mean, okay I, did, I didn't really star. yes is, is i did very think much, uh, very that. closely inspired by chief brody's car and but also I didn't, in season I three know. you know we've been i didn't really feel like he was very much a chief brody though I can see it now, but the car I definitely did think was a reference to that. And wanting a Larry, Larry Vaughn is the man. Also a city cop come to a small town, though this is a tourist town, so a little bit different, but still, he's only got like one other officer to help him with stuff. That's dude hanging out back here. Aaron Jaws, and we've been wanting a Larry Vaughn character every year, and we've never oh, had room, yeah. and we finally Season three. have room this year for it, so Carrie Elwes yeah. is just incredible, it's coming and Damn. sort of taken on this part of Mayor that's very much inspired by that, where it's someone who is much more concerned about his doing Man, I had a chance to meet him two, week, two, three weeks ago, but I, I missed we it. We were talking about the Demogorgon. I was able to meet Kevin Conroy, though, so it wasn't a total loss, but I missed him by a few hours. In season one, he was very much influenced by the shark and Jaws because um, we wanted it to be a shark-like creature, except instead of coming out from under the water, he was coming out from another dimension. So that was, he would break through the surface of that dimension, reach into ours, grab That's a cool. victim like Barb, for instance, and pull that victim back into his world. So instead of the underwater, it's um, the upside down. John Hughes in general. See, I know John the John Hughes, Hughes vibe, but I don't know how many John Hughes really, films I've actually seen. About these sort of outcasts that are coming together and, and, you know, they have all these differences, but at the end of the day, they end up realizing that they have more in common than they thought. And that sort of character development is something we talk about. Uh, when we're working on the show. When we were working on season two or developing season two, we always knew we wanted to end at the snowball, which is an idea that we had introduced at the end of, even end of season one. And so we always knew that that was gonna be the ending of season two. It feels like at least 50% or more of the classic teen 80s films feature some sort okay, of- Okay, I've seen 16 Candles. Everything goes down. John Hughes- is Haven't seen Pretty in Pink. That, and so we wanted to pay. Pay homage to, to that. This year, I haven't we seen have Breakfast Club. I think that's a John Hughes movie. working with movie. At, at the mall, which is Robin played by Maya Hawk, and the, the the whole vibe there in the mall is very John Hughes, and that we have a bunch of characters kind of forced to work together who normally would not associate with one another. Favorite movie of all time, right there. We saw Jurassic Park in theaters, and me too. I just remember it, when it, it just first came out. Lines, just in terms of. The spectacle and the, the dinosaurs were just so incredible, and they, and, they, and they honestly still are. It holds up so well. And Jurassic Park is referenced, or was a reference for us in season two, particularly episode eight, when our characters are stuck in Hawkins' lab and they have to escape, and Bob has to go and uh, sort of. You know, As, to go that's exactly what I thought. For them to get out, which is very similar to when Lord Dern has to sort of follow a map and reboot the power. The power. Back on in Jurassic Park. It goes better for Laura Dern, though, it than it did for Bob, unfortunately for Bob. Uh, and then also season season three, it's a pretty big reference. We have a lot, we have some hiding sequences uh, with the children uh, this year that 
was, was very much inspired by the uh, classic uh, kitchen scene in Jurassic Park. Where yeah, I didn't even put that together. We, we watched that over and over because again. Because of the mall it's setting. One, it's, you know, one of the best suspense sequences in film history, which is uh, when the kids are hiding from the raptors in the kitchen. Incredible yes. filmmaking. You can learn everything you need to know about directing suspense from watching that scene. Have not seen Mad Max either. We're big Mad Max fans, so when this new kid, Max, comes into town, we figured she Mad might Max. be a Mad Max fan as well. And like Max, she's an outsider that's sort of coming into this community. So we felt that it, it, it applied to her character and that this is someone that feels very different than the others and she's, she's just really an outcast. And then ultimately she ends up, of course, bonding with a group and becoming a hero. And then driving like a badass, driving, driving like Mel Gibson. Hello! Whoa. Oh, incredible. I told you, Zuma. Risky business, not seen. I know that moment, but I have not seen it. Risky Business, first of all, if you haven't seen Risky Business, you know, it's a great film. It's kind of weirdly dark 80s film. In season two, it's one of our more direct references, of course, again, Steve and Nancy arrive at their Halloween party dressed as the characters from Risky oh, Business. Oh, which also worked because it was all white when we wanted it to, when she spills the punch to be, uh, to be a very dramatic event. So the, that all white outfit really worked out for us. The hell? Holy fuck. Scanners is a great film and it's, it was a reference for us particularly in terms of- Never seen powers. it. So in episode seven of, of season one, where she just sort of makes the uh, government agent's minds melt. It's not as grotesque as scanners. I don't think Netflix would have loved it if we had blown their heads up, but uh, th that was our version of it. Without getting into too big spoiler territory, we definitely go a bit Cronenberg in season three. Of the show. And when we were temping sound, I remember, we couldn't quite get the right exploding sound. So for the temp sound, we, uh, we, we just took it from scanners. Uh, it was the best explosion sound we could find still. Not seen Stand By Me. Stand By Me is one of our favorite films. We saw it when we were really young. I remember being a big deal because we were watching an R-rated movie, which we weren't allowed to watch a lot of R-rated movies. Because they just cursed, because they just cursed though, it was, a, a, our parents deemed it was okay. Deemed it appropriate and yeah. I just thought we should watch it and I'm really glad they let us watch it. Um, you know, Stand By Me is based on a novella by Stephen King called The Body. It's not a coincidence that we named uh, episode four of season one, The Body. Sort of our most direct nod to it is when we have well, in season one and two, we have characters sort of walking down these these train tracks, um, which is, you know, that was a, that was That's a the only thing I know about, about the movie is like train tracks. some kids on a train track. So that's probably that's our most, it. our most direct homage to that, to that classic. We actually, when we were auditioning our kids, we had them audition with scenes um, from that film. I think a lot of our kids hadn't seen Stand By Me, and we that was a homework assignment for them that they had to watch Stand By Me. <laughs> I've definitely seen this one. Empire Strikes Back is, uh, I mean, we go back and forth whether we like that or New Hope better. It's sort of like Alien Aliens. It depends on uh, uh, day of the week. But it was a big film for us growing up. And first of all, Love and Powers uh, can be seen as force-like, and that's why we have Mike showing her the, the Yoda figurine uh, in his mm -hmm. room in, in episode two, Weirdo on, on Maple Street. And, you know, the boys are obviously huge uh, Star Wars fans, as they would be at that time. And so and when Dustin feels he's being, someone's being a traitor, he refers to them as Lance. Lando, which is obviously a reference to, to Empire as well. Yeah. Would you shut and he would say, never tell me the and odds. And also, we always saw episode seven of season two as sort of Eleven going to her Dagobah and seeing her Yoda, uh, which was eight, you know, and sort of in this experience, her, her, some her dark side of, Yoda uh, in, enhancement of her powers trying to get her to use her, her powers for evil so you know her or well vengeance the train, or, rather than know, it's it's, it's very being the superhero uh, evokes uh, the boys wanted to, to do. pull his plane out of the swamp, out of the yeah. swamp or... super eight it's a good movie Super 8, so this a one. lot like our show, it was paying homage and it and trying to capture the spirit of these films that we, we grew up loving. We have a, a scene in season two, episode six, I believe, when they're in the uh, 
kids are hiding in uh, in the bus and the, the demo dogs are attacking it, which is similar to a scene uh, in Super 8 when they're, when they're also hiding the bus from the giant monsters um, coming from it. And, w and one of the boys in Super 8 uses firecrackers to fight the, fight the monster without That's true. giving away too much. The kids may or may not employ fireworks to their advantage in season three. Seen Evil Dead, the first one, and the remake. I've not seen Evil Dead 2 or Evil Army Dead's of Darkness, of those movies though. movies that we saw when we were way too young. You know, it's a pretty funny movie, actually. Um, but, you know, when you're that young, the humor is completely lost in you, and we just thought it was straight up terrifying. I'm trying to think, like, specifically what we referenced. Well, about. it's the poster. Obviously, oh, yeah. Well, Jonathan has the poster up in his room, which uh, his yeah. uh, deadbeat dad uh, disapproves of. But we felt like Jonathan would be someone who would like this. Because, you know, it was an independent film at the time, and it was, it was still. It was pretty uh, pretty extreme uh, back then, as it is still now, and so we felt though that Jonathan, as this outcast, would be someone who would love uh, love Evil Dead. I'm not sure how he saw it actually, but you know, he found a way. <laughs> he did. We've seen The Exorcist. Amen. Well, The Exorcist, obviously, if you're going to have any sort of evil child, that is the the go-to go-to film and so in season two when we have will possess that or know, the only you know his head doesn't spin around but we did try to capture a little bit of that eeriness that you'd feel from yeah, uh, Linda i can Blair. see that and will of course he you know he likes it cold the mind flavor likes it cold reagan and in the exorcist i mean it's it it gets over the course of that film it gets the the temperature in that house That's gets right. it gets increasingly cold I always get the fog and the mist confused. The fog was a big reference for us in terms of, specifically in terms of the music score. We cut together a trailer for Netflix to help sh sell the show. We used a, right. um, a track from the fog. This year, there's a very fog-like scene in season three. This isn't getting too spoilery, I hope, but you see Billy in the upside down and he sees some figures coming towards him out of the fog, who those figures okay, are. I think I've seen the mist. Finally seen The Goonies, reactions on the channel, the Goonies, check it out. Uh, the Goonies. <laughs> I remember, when, I mean, when we first watched The Goonies when we were kids, we immediately just hit rewind on the VHS and watched it again. And uh, obviously, just sort of the energy that the kids had in the camaraderie was a, was a, is a big touchstone for us. Yeah, and, and specifically, I think it was probably more overtly referenced in season two mm -hmm. when we had, you know, in, in, in the final episode, um, season nine, when, when they go all go down into the tunnel together. It feels a lot like the Goonies going underground in search of their treasure. It's a little bit of a darker uh, take on that, but it was a big reference. And of course we had, you know, one of the, the lead of uh, the Goonies was Sean Astin, yep. who, you know, we cast in season two as Bob, which was, you know, a real treat for us. So to have a grown up Sean Astin in our film, and he in fact references something as a, uh, as a, as a treasure map. Don't you get it? It's not a puzzle. It's a map. It's a map of Hawkins. So a little, little nod to his, his role in the Goonies and Sean was all about doing it. Seen the Terminator, seen... I'll be back. I haven't seen all of the Salvation franchise. or, or any of Genesis, Terminator franchise. In the but every movie, other that, that Terminator film the I've seen. Terminator to T2, I'm gonna get some hate for that. Arnold's a bad dude, so. Arnold, I like Arnold as a bad guy. Yeah. And T2, so very much superiority we to in this house, thank Arnold you. This year in season three, and we found the most incredible Arnold lookalike, but he also captures very much the spirit yes, of Arnold. Yes, man. I wish I could talk about the character more with us. Like I was saying in the, in the, in the reactions to see that season, man, the T-1000 and Arnold's Terminator, like that dude looks like if you took Robert Patrick, and I've said this a hundred times in those reactions, and smashed him and Arnold together, it, it would be that guy. Like, it's uncanny. Spoiling things, but I can't. That just, we have a Terminator esque character who is not a robot, however. There's not like some twist that he's a robot. That would be a little ridiculous. Yeah. Seen the thing. Wild movie, man. Man, the body horror in it. So The Thing is one of our favorite movies. I think we saw it a little bit later. Like, I think we were in high school because it's like all the movie books that talked about how this wasn't a good movie, which just blows my mind. <laughs> you know, especially season three, just in terms of that we have, again, I don't want to get too spoily, but the monster or yeah. monsters uh, uh, this season are sort of inspired can see it. by the monster work that they did on The Thing in terms of that. It's certainly our grossest season yet, and, and that's one thing we, we do love about the thing, which is just sort of how 
uh, uh, grotesque it is. And there's actually a dialogue scene between the kids in season three where they discuss the merits of what is better, the, the Howard Hawks the, thing, the original thing from the 50s, or uh, John Carpenter's uh, remake. It's like Carpenter's the thing. The original is the classic, no question about it. But the remake? We also, of course, season two, we have the flamethrower element and the fact that this thing doesn't it doesn't react well to flame, that the creatures react neg negatively to fire. I mean, that, that was a big that, element. That and, can be ac um, ac thing, ac really applicable to thrower. Alien as well. To show our love and affection for the thing, we have the boys in the basement. Mike has a poster of the thing. And yep. Mr. Clark is when they call him to oh, try yeah. to figure out about the uh, how to create their own sort of isolation tank. Mr. Clark, of course, is watching the thing uh, with his girlfriend and, and trying Trying to explain how they created these effects in the first place. Because again, Matt and I are It's just wild, still, man. You know, we love to how they did the VFX on really that movie. Mind -blowing All practically. Them. Don't know this one. I want you to tell me everything you saw when you went in the bathroom. Witness. So it's weird. So so not everything we reference is, um, you know, is a genre film. And so we're huge fans of the director, um, Peter Weir. But there, there was a scene... Um, with Harrison Ford in the police station when um, a little the little boy in the police station points at a picture of of the murderer who ha murderer who happens to be actually a cop who works with Harrison Ford's character we had a sort of very similar scene spoilers incidents where <laughs> 11 sees the photo of Will while in Mike's room and points at it and we really weren't quite sure how oh to man shoot they the both have like huge really doe eyes witness and how Peter Weir shot that scene and and he he used a lot of you know of of zooming camera and at that point before then we hadn't really used the zoom okay. because we were worried about it being too cheesy or cliche but a after we shot that scene we loved how it turned out and we now kind of embraced the zoom thanks wired so that has been Damn. each and every movie reference in strange mostly things. Not, not all but, but a lot no, most of them a lot of them <laughs> 70% 80% yeah well, there you have it, guys. We made it through. That was uh, chunky, to say the least. Wow, we're at over 30 minutes now. Woo! Man, I loved it. That was fun. Especially, like, all the different iconic movies throughout there that, at least that I know, and then plenty that I know a lot of. And I'm going to have to watch one of these days. There's, like, so many movies on here What that... See, like with like I mentioned E.T., but I don't I feel like I've watched it. Or it, maybe it's just been on on a TV and I just wasn't paying attention, kinda like Goonies. Cause I I don't aside from the dress up scene, the scene with E.T. in the closet, the phone home, and then the going home, and then obviously the bike scene, no I know no, I can't remember anything else. And I could have easily picked up any of that stuff from just second hand references and stuff like that but yeah man it's wild lots of iconic huge movies man a lot of my favorites a lot of stuff that still stands the test of time if any of these movies that i've mentioned that you haven't seen check them out for sure and maybe one of these days i'll be able to clear off all of the movies that were brought up on this list but for now guys we're about to dive into season four. So next week, be ready because we are finally jumping back into volume two, season four of Stranger Things. And uh, from what they've said, the, these last two episodes are longer and even darker than we've seen so far. So I'm concerned, <laughs> anxious and excited. Guys, love to know your thoughts on this video, on the state of the franchise, some of your favorite movies, Maybe even some references you guys caught in the season so far that they didn't mention on this list. Drop them all in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. We'll carry on the conversation after the video. Feel free to join our Discord. We could talk about it there as well. Links to that in all my social description box below. Check out my reactions if you have not. Subscribe if you have not. And before you go, I want to shout out our channel legends. Manny Sherritt, Jason Coleman, Philly Vane, Yuri Corey Scott, Margaret Grace, Mary Bradley, Melita, Robert Anguiano, and Cal Kestis Nation. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. But that's it for this video, guys. And it is been a wild ride. And I'm not saying that I might not react to some of the other ones here at one point or another, but 
might <laughs> figure that out as we go along. If there's anything down and out, we got some shows wrapping up here soon. Might have some free time, maybe. Not making promises. Might just do some for some fun in the weeks to come uh, following season four's release. But we'll see. But guys, that's it for this one. I'll see you all in the next one. Take care, everybody.